Excellent. OK, so um, as I uh, said at the beginning of this um, workshop, I'm Jeff Boward and I'm from NPL. Actually, I'm from the time and frequency group at NPL, but that's because the high finesse optical cavities uh, that we use in world of time and frequency turn out to be really good for trace gas sensing, as you'll hear later in the talk from Nicola. So this is um, a fairly um, going to be a fairly introductory sort of talk to laser spectroscopy. I just wanted to outline some basic ideas for those of you who may not be quite so familiar with the techniques that we'll be talking about later on. And the general idea, of course, is that we're using laser spectroscopy. It might be a direct measurement of linear absorption or it might be some other variant, for example, um, measuring um, uh, the photoacoustic wave in photoacoustic spectroscopy using um, uh, high, higher power pulse lasers. But essentially, we're looking at a measurement of the linear absorption to measure chemical composition. And we're therefore measuring trace levels of this contaminant, uh, for example, in air or another matrix gas. And this gives us a signal that's proportional or closely proportional to concentration. And we should have uh, some theory that tells whether it's uh, what, what this, any slight nonlinearity is. And I was also going to say that um, for those of you who know a bit, bit more about laser spectroscopy, they're only going to be covering sort of linear absorption spectroscopy of room temperature molecules. So um, these lines that we're talking about are going to be Doppler broadened or pressure broadened lines. And we're not looking at, we're not talking about Doppler free techniques like saturated absorption. Um, it's just a straightforward linear absorption that we're considering. Uh, I should emphasize that uh, the traceability for these measurements is really via the gravimetric preparation of standards. And this is something that uh, at MPL, um, our gas spectrology group is expert in. But spectroscopy does allow us to measure the reproducibility of these standards and we can verify the accuracy of dynamic methods that are used to prepare different concentrations. So if we can calibrate our spectroscopic instrument, it's a very convenient way of providing uh, traceable measurements uh, in the field of these different contaminants. So Thomas has already covered some of these areas of gas sensing, but I thought I'd pick out a few. Um, in particular, I should wanted to say that this particular project, MetAMC, Metrology for Airborne Contaminants, uh, is targeting uh, measurement of certain um, uh, airborne contaminants that are found in clean rooms that are used for semiconductor chip manufacturing. Um, we've called the project MetAMC2 because there was in fact a first MetAMC project that finished in 2016 and that was mainly uh, looking at uh, ammonia concentration measurements. This current project um, has got a number of different aspects to it, but um, we've uh, concentrated this time on HCl. It's, changing the molecule is not just the only thing that we've we've done. We've, we're looking more at uh, intercomparisons this time, for example, and um, uh, there are uh, you know a, a different measurement methods and different um, preparation techniques, but there are other molecules like HF that uh, are, are critical for semiconductor chip manufacturing. One might think of general environmental uh, applications, uh, the various contaminants there. That's not an exclusive list, of course, that you might want to measure in air. Um, but there are some others that are really quite interesting. I don't know how many of you know that MPL has a hydrogen car, a demonstration hydrogen car. So I've got a, a picture of that in the um, uh, in the line of photos below, and it's um, uh, also shown there parked next to the hydrogen filling station that we've got at MPL. But there are standards that are um, you can find out about um, that uh, decree what limits are allowable in, in hydrogen fuel. Uh, ammonia, which we studied in the first uh, MetAMC project, is, is one of these. Formaldehyde is another, but there's there's a fairly long list and you can look them up. 
Um, so spectroscopic techniques can be used for that. Um, measurements in biomethane or methane are certainly critical. Um, it's a little bit more of a problem in this um, uh, application because, of course, methane has very many absorption lines throughout the spectrum. So you need to be a little bit careful where you uh, uh, tune your laser to to be sure that it's a line of your contaminant that um, is in the spectral region where um, there are uh, no methane absorptions. And I think the application to health is actually quite interesting. It's um, uh, ammonia, for example, is uh, in exhaled breath is symptomatic of uh, some health conditions, kidney complaints, for example. Um, and there have been papers published on, um, uh, for example, uh, the emissions of uh, acetylene and carbon monoxide for uh, uh, smokers who are otherwise healthy, apart from the fact they smoke. Um, and there, are, there have been review articles quite recently. I think earlier this year, there was a review paper showing, uh, listing, uh, listing and discussing a number of these so-called biomarkers in people's breath. So that's, if you can measure these in high concentrations of water vapour, uh, this is an interesting application area as well. So I thought I'd make some initial uh, basic points about laser spectroscopy. Um, it can be a very sensitive method, but you do need to have a very long path length. And there are uh, a couple of ways that people uh, often use to get these long path lengths uh, in a laboratory space. One is that you can have um, multi-pass cells. I'll talk a little bit about these later. That there are Harriet cells, for example, or white cells that are available that you could use and high finesse optical cavities um, and certainly the talks this morning are uh, centered on laser spectroscopy that use a single frequency laser of course that targets airborne contaminant you have to select your laser carefully uh, to make sure it tunes over to this one absorption line for this um, target contaminant, but you can consider multi-frequency sources. So we're looking forward to these some interesting talks this afternoon on comb spectroscopy that have the potential for looking for uh, many different contaminants. Uh, Thomas has already mentioned that these me methods work best with smaller molecules, and that's because very larger molecules, VOCs, um, have an, a large number of rotational and vibrational lines. And uh, it very rapidly becomes the case that these lines overlap and you end up with a sort of continuum. So you don't get strong lines on a, on a low absorption background. So that makes it quite difficult to use a lot of these techniques. But there's still a lot of molecules, as you, we've already seen, that are really good, strong interest in a wide variety of applications. Um, observing an absorption at a very specific laser wavelength provides a reasonably strong indicator that we've actually got the right contaminant molecule that we're targeting. Uh, and as I've already mentioned, there are different techniques, photoacoustic spectroscopy, uh, cavity ring down spectroscopy. There are talks on these different applications later on, uh, as different ways of looking at these, um, uh, measuring these um, linear absorptions. And MET-AMC is towards the end of its project, it aims to start into comparisons between some of these different methods. So here's um, a fairly typical uh, laser uh, linear absorption measurement. Uh, we have a laser, which in the case of ammonia would be at 1527 nanometers. And this is going through in this figure and a low pressure ammonia cell, and you tune the laser, uh, for example, by uh, changing the temperature of the laser and you can see uh, a plot there that I've obtained uh, as a function of uh, the linear absorption as a function of uh, laser frequency. And so the linear absorption uh, in the case of weak absorption is really quite straightforward. It's the cell length times the number of molecules per unit volume times some constant, which is the molecular cross section. And if it's a strong absorption, then we can write down that the transmitted signal is just the incident signal times this exponential. So this is the fairly well-known Beer law that uh, I think Thomas also mentioned earlier. Unfortunately, uh, unfortunately over a, a, a large number of years, quite a number of years now, um, there have been a lot of research groups uh, gathering data on a, these different molecules, and people have been 
working very hard to put them together into a, a big publicly available database. Perhaps the most commonly used is Hytran. You'll see the link there. And they hold for a lot of different molecules, um, cross sections and frequencies and lots of other data about all the different lines that uh, these um, uh, molecules have. There are other databases that people sometimes use, PNNL and GESA. Um, and um, you'll see there in the figure that the ammonia data that I had on the previous slide, I've uh, used some software that we wrote at MPL to fit uh, the observed features to um, uh, devoid profiles. Um, and um, uh, well, I've already mentioned the point down there that uh, these nicely discrete lines are really only observed in these smaller molecules, not so easy in, in larger molecules. But it, th this whole model works very well for, for small molecules like ammonia. And Hytran allows you to plot out um, these line strengths over a wide frequency range. So this is just something I uh, uh, the other day for ammonia and uh, sorry for HCl and for CO. Um, and you'll see that the lines in the mid infrared say wavelengths longer than I don't know three microns or so. Uh, they're much stronger, several tens of times stronger than the lines in the near infrared, which is where certainly at MPL we're concentrating our efforts. But that's because there are a lot more optical components, um, detectors and modulators, fast detectors and modulators that are available in the one to two, one to two and a half micron region. Um, so you have that advantage, but the lines are rather weaker. Um, and as I already mentioned, larger molecules, I mean, slightly larger molecules like water or um, methane, they do have more complicated spectra. They're still uh, discrete lines, but um, there are a lot more of them and um, cover a much wider part of the, of the spectrum. So I've already explained uh, that these absorption profiles, for example, have the common Voigt um, function uh, distribution. Uh, but then there arises the interesting question as to whether we can see these, uh, uh, observe these lines in a way that's a little bit cleverer than just looking at the straightforward DC absorption. And there are methods available. You could take your laser and frequency modulate it. This is a helium neon laser. Uh, actually, it's of a type used at MPL for the practical realization of the meter, the unit of length. And there's an electric on one of the mirrors, and that's dithered at a frequency of a few hundred hertz, or we could dither it in up to a few kilohertz region, but that's limited by piezo resonances. And then the profiles, the absorption profiles, in this case of iodine, are observed as a derivative of the normal absorption profile. So they go through an electronic zero crossing uh, at line center. So that's actually very handy for server control applications. But it gives you a much better um, uh, signal to noise ratio using a phase sensitive detector. But you can get the best results um, using much higher modulation frequencies at the few megahertz region or above, where these um, lines, uh, where these modulation frequencies are above the kind of technical noise limits of the laser. So you can get down to shot noise limited detection. So here's a schematic of uh, what you can do in this arrangement. So the light from your single frequency laser is um, sent through a phase modulator, which uh, is being driven at uh, let's say a few tens, few hundreds of megahertz or higher. And that gives you a carrier with sidebands at the drive frequency. That, so that's the output spectrum that exits this uh, analyzer. And when these sidebands have got equal intensity, this is pure phase modulation. So the photo detector doesn't see anything at the drive frequency. But as the laser tunes through an absorption line, the sidebands become imbalanced. And this gives you an amplitude modulation at the drive frequency that you can see with a photo detector. So this form of very high frequency modulation spectroscopy is often termed Pound-Driever-Hall spectroscopy. 
and uh, well actually for comb spectral for, for comb um, laser development john uh, got the nobel prize in uh, 2005 there's a picture of john hall um and uh, but this is a technique brought over from um microwave uh, spectroscopy and that's where pound and driever had their expertise but you'll see here that we still get uh, a sort of derivative type feature at least they have zero electronic crossings at line center so this is um uh, a modulation at one and a half gigahertz um and you'll see the um uh the features that uh for the linear absorption features which are observed in this um uh, pdh profile down in the picture on the left and i've also shown this fairly simple schematic of uh pound driver hall spectroscopy the uh, photo detector output is sent through a double balance mixer and that's the output that you see in the blue plot on the left so in this slide i've just tabulated some lines that you can use for the detection of a number of these simple molecules i've restricted myself a bit to um laser wavelengths in the one to two micron region where there are lasers that are commercially available uh, but as i've already made the point the absorption is a bit stronger in the mid infrared let's say in the three to ten micron region um, but uh, a lot of the optics technology is much better established in the one to two micron region um, i think i've already made the point that, that we do need to be a bit careful if lines overlap if we're looking for more than one molecular species uh, but in general it is possible to find uh, lines uh, free of say water or methane lines um, uh, uh, in uh, in these molecules um, so um, that those you'll see for example it's hcl at 1742 and that's where we're working at at, um, uh, at mpl and um, if uh, we want to go to multi-pass cells for much better linear absorption then um, there are at least two options available to us one is a so-called white cell and we did do some work with white cells at mpl uh, quite a few years ago and uh, i've got a schematic of that arrangement on the top right there and we got down to the low nanomole per mole level we had a laser at 1392 nanometers for that uh, 10 meter path length from Thor Labs. You can buy Harriet cells. There's a schematic down the bottom there um, with rather longer path lengths. That's a rather clever design of mirrors that allow you that multi passing arrangement. And of, with both these systems, the signal noise obviously increases with longer averaging time until we reach some limit. Um, for example, some non white noise limit uh, for maybe small ethanol effects or some other problem. Um, so that governs the um, uh, limit of detection for these different devices. But the longest path lengths can be with very high finesse optical cavities. Um, and this is really quite a simple optical arrangement. They're just a pair of mirrors that are separated, um, for example, by 10 centimeters. That's a common spacing for the cavities that we've got at MPL. One of the uh, uh, mirrors is put on a piezoelectric for length tuning and as um, and, and under conditions when the separation between these mirrors is an integral number of half wavelengths then optical power builds up and um, that uh, kind of resonant condition the light traverses the spacing many, many times, and that increases the effective path length and therefore the detection sensitivity. So these high finesse optical cavities are the key component of, for example, cavity ring down spectrometers uh, and also the NISOM system that uh, Nicola will be talking about uh, later this morning that we're developing at MPL. So here's um, uh, a cavity ring down measurement that uh, I did a few years ago uh, and this is um, uh, shows a time constant of 7.7 .7 microseconds so this is light that's resonant with the cavity and then all of a sudden you 
uh, use a modulator of some kind to turn the the light off and the cavity explains uh, displays this ring down uh, this shows a line width therefore of 21 kilohertz and for this particular cavity where the free spectral range was 5 gigahertz this corresponds to a finesse of about 240,000. So this gives a path length of 150,000 or so times the single path length and a change, a reduction in this decay time can indicate an absorbing gas in the spacer. So that gives you the concentration measurement for cavity ring down systems. So I'm not going to describe this nice ends arrangement in very much detail because Nicola will do that later on. Um, but that's basically uh, comprises a laser source which goes through an electroptic modulator and you modulate that um, at the free spectral range of the cavity, which is in this case one and a half gigahertz and both the sideband and carrier resonate within the cavity. That gives you a signal uh, very much like the pound driver hall, the PDH signal um, in the way that I uh, explained earlier. OK, so I think I've pretty much run out of time. Um, I've tried to give you an introductory summary to laser spectroscopy at a fairly uh, straightforward level. It's a really useful technique for confirming both the trace contaminants and the uh, concentration. Uh, of course, if you had multiple laser frequencies like a comb system, you could determine uh, you could probably identify the component as well as measure the concentration that will be covered later on. Uh, I've explained that different spectroscopic techniques are being exploited uh, commercially and also being developed as research programs at different European NMIs and speakers later th today uh, from different organisations will be describing these in detail more fully. But we're generally talking about um, measurements in the nanomole per mole, sometimes a little bit better than that parts per trillion, um, but generally nanomoles per mole to micromoles per mole. So the traceability is via gravimetric standards, but the spectroscopy allows verification of this and the um, accuracy of some of the preparation methods. So uh, I don't know if there are any questions or... Um, Thank you, Jeff. There's definitely time for a few general questions here, or again, we can hold them for uh, specific questions when the different spectroscopic techniques are described in later talks. But feel free to raise your hand or type something quickly into the chat or just speak out. <laughs> One hand I can see. Alexandra? Yes. <clears throat> Hello, this is uh, Alexander Foltinovich from um, Umeå University in Sweden. Uh, thank yep. you very much for the uh, very interesting and comprehensive uh, talk. Uh, <laughs> I just have a, a comment because I saw that you referred to the frequency modulation signal as the pounder hole signal. And uh, I'm just more used to calling the signal for that is used for locking to the cavity, which is which uses the same principle as the pounder hole. And I believe that in Parallel to, to this, uh, it was Gary Bjorklund who developed the frequency modulation for spectroscopic sensing. So uh, I just found it interesting that you uh, referred to the spectroscopic signal as pound or hole. We usually reserve this PDH for the locking signal. Okay. So just uh, <laughs> Yes, I mean, the, the Bjorklund methods, there, there are different. So there are sort of uh, other modulation uh, spectroscopy methods as well. There's uh, two-tone frequency modulation spectroscopy methods and um, but I, I, I agree I do loosely describe PDH as both the cavity locking signal and the spectroscopy Yeah I mean they, they, they use exactly the same principle it's yes. uh, just a matter of <laughs> I think they were developing this really in, in parallel but just yes. for different uh, applications. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other quick questions or comments? not back to you Anne probably. Yeah thank you very much Jeff. <laughs> um, then we can move on to our more specific talks so we have um, um, Helene who's going to be talking about uh, her cavity-based techniques at VSL. Are you ready to present? Oh it will be not Helene. 